Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. I hope you had a good weekend. I commented in the first hour about the tragedy uh, in uh, regard to the students in the bus hit by the FedEx truck and, of course, the evil. There are tragedies and there are evils. They're not the same thing. And the evil uh, in the killings at the Jewish Community Center in Overland Park, Kansas. I'll review some of those things in the course of the show. I I want to uh, talk, however, to uh, someone from the Wall Street Journal. In fact, he's not just someone. He's reported on energy for it. He's the senior energy reporter for the Wall Street Journal, Russell Gold. And uh, there is a news item. He has a book out. The Boom, How Fracking Ignited the American Energy Revolution and Changed the World. And I have so many questions for you, Russell Gold. I am delighted to have you uh, on the show, and welcome. Thanks so much. I'll try to give you the answers, what answers I have. Okay. Did you happen to see this brand new news item, Ohio? This is, uh, this one is from the Los Angeles Times, but uh, uh, Ohio finds links between fracking and sudden burst of earthquakes? Right. Yeah, I did say that. Okay. You have any comments? Well, it's it's really important because up until Friday, what one of the things I always said was most of the earthquakes that are associated with fracking are associated with injection wells, right? You put water in to frack a well, and then you bring the water out. You've got to do something with that water because it's got various contaminants in it. So you typically injected it deep underground. And, and so, you know, it was not going to be too difficult to figure out how to avoid earthquakes because you just need to figure out, you just need to make sure you didn't put your disposal wells where there were active faults. What Ohio is saying is we believe that some of these very small earthquakes, you know, the one and two and, and the largest was a three on the Richter scale, are actually related to fracking itself. And, you know, that raises a really interesting question because all of a sudden it's the pot, you know, you, we need to start talking about are there certain areas where we just shouldn't be fracking because of risk of earthquakes or, or other reasons. And I think that's a, it's a change in the discourse and it's going to be really interesting to see where this goes. What is your hunch? Well, my hunch is that these... These earthquakes we're talking about, Ohio, are very small. They're very limited. Um, as uh, as uh, Stanford professor Mark Zoback said in the Wall Street Journal in an article we had about this on Saturday, you know, of all of the big things we should be worried about with fracking, these earthquakes are very far down in the list. Uh, but I do think that we're going to have more of a conversation going forward as to where should we be fracking and where shouldn't we be fracking. Uh, how much community control should we should we give? You know, to, should we let local communities make that decision or not? Um, these are all discussions that are going on right now, and they're really important discussions. The geologist that they cite in the Los Angeles Times article, the Ohio geologist, mm-hmm. his wife runs an anti-fracking organization. Well, it, no, and that's in the article. I didn't okay. do research. No, I, that's uh, <laughs> uh, that I didn't know of. Well, you know what? That then. It, and this is probably should be the case regardless of who his, wife, who his wife is, that Ohio should send out their results to get peer-reviewed, to have other people look at them. Well, here, let me read it to you. Okay. You, you should know this. Ray Byersdorfer, a Youngstown State University geology professor whose wife co-founded Frack Free America. So, <laughs> so I just want you to know that. Well, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, look... This is too important to get wrong, right? That, yeah, that, yeah, you would that, think. That it, 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 whether it's you're, 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 whether you're married to someone who's anti-fracking or, or somebody who works for the industry, it's just, this is too important to get wrong. They, we're talking about uh, lots of jobs, lots of energy that the country is using and needs, and, and uh, you know, some really important changes in the geopolitics. Uh, in, 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 in the future of our energy, we, we just can't get this wrong and monkey around with uh, someone make, coming up with a very important finding, but then we're all going to be debating that finding because of who is white. All right. Do, do me and, and my listeners a favor sure. and explain fracking yes. as if you were writing fracking for dummies. Okay. Real simply, you drill a well straight down into the ground, and then you curve that well so you're running through this thick shale rock or, or some other type rock which has oil and gas in it. Um, and that once you've drilled the well, nothing's going to go into that well because the oil and gas is trapped in this super t- 
tight, this super dense rock. So then you pump down water with some chemicals and sand and uh, so this this frac fluid. You pump it into the well and force it up against like a 200 foot section of rock. And you put so much pressure on that. It's a, the best way I can describe it is think about if you're swimming and you go a couple feet down in a swimming pool and you feel pressure in your eardrums when you're five feet down. Well, the amount of pressure that you're putting onto that rock is greater than the amount of pressure you would feel if you were sitting on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, 12,000 feet down. Just enormous horsepower. And eventually, water doesn't compress. So eventually you push it up against a rock hard enough, the rock's going to give. And it creates this, this network of fractures that goes all throughout the rock, um, stretches for a couple hundred feet in, in every direction. And the oil and gas, and oh, so then you pull the water out, and you leave the sand behind to prop open these new cracks, and lo and behold, oil and natural gas starts flowing out of this well. And, and you, you've, you've gotten energy from where you were unable to get it before. And there, there is so much energy located in those rocks? In that shale rock specifically, we've turned around. Uh, we've turned around U.S. oil production was declining, declining, declining. Starting in about 2007, 2008, we've gone up two million barrels a day. I mean, let me give you, a, you and your listeners, a sense of just how much oil is there in the Bakken, which is the oil field in North Dakota. Wait, it's, forgive me, forgive yeah. me. Is it oil or or, or energy? I, both. I, it's both. Depends where you go. You go to Pennsylvania, you're usually getting gas out of it. You go to uh, South Texas and North Dakota, you're getting oil out of it. It's the same techniques, it uh, just depends on what's in the rock. But Okay, you were talking about well, the, the oil fields for, in North Dakota. For instance, you go up to North Dakota, the Bakken. A couple years ago, 2005, the, North Dakota as a state was producing eh, about 100,000 barrels a day, not much. They're now at a million barrels a day. That's more than two members of OPEC produce. So, you know, you ask, is there really that much oil Just and gas? out of North Dakota. Just North Dakota. Now, and then you add into that the Marcellus, this giant gas field in Pennsylvania, the Eagleford in South Texas, and you begin to understand just how much oil and gas is out there. The U.S. has now become the largest oil and gas producer in the world, if you combine those two. Saudi Arabia still produces why are more we oil. In, why are we importing then? <laughs> well, we still need a lot more oil than we use. Uh, we, we use about a quarter of the, of the world's oil just in the United States. So we're a big producer, but we're not that big. How much of the fracking produces oil and how much other forms of energy? Well, Ray, it, when we started doing this, when the industry started doing this a few years back, they found gas, and they produced lots and lots of gas. In fact, they produced so much gas that we, the prices just tumbled, went from about $15 per million BTUs uh, to, to $3. And so then the industry turned and started looking for oil and found lots of it. So what's the breakdown right now? I would say roughly 70-30 maybe, 70% right now is oil and 30% is gas. But that's just because where the industry is looking, you can make a lot more money off oil right now. If gas prices come back up, there, is a, there are just warehouses of, the, of this waiting, to be, uh, waiting for more wells to be drilled. Uh, in from, the from, a, from a carbon perspective, yes. uh, one would want the frackers to do more uh, gas than Absolutely. oil. Absolutely. Excellent point, Dennis. Yep. No oh, question right. about that. So the opposition to fracking is twofold. It's it's more oil. I don't happen to be in the opposition, but I'm I'm, I'm articulating their their views. I understand. So so the one is that it's producing a carbon emitter, oil, and the other is, and that's the other that I want to talk to you about. Because even if it was 100 percent non-oil, 100 percent gas, they would still oppose it. And what reason would they give then? They don't want to support fossil fuel. Uh, well, all right. Well, that that's the that's the the oil part. No, it's it's both. It's oil and natural gas. Um, now, you're asking me to give you a really nuanced, rational argument, and I'm not sure I can because I'm not sure I fully understand what the the nuanced, rational argument. Did is. Did you see Gasland? Uh, I did see Gasland. Look, let me. It's been a couple of years. It's not something I, I watched. No, no, no. Time. But I, 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 it, it, <laughs> it, because there's a fantastic response to it in the documentary Frack Nation. 
I, I don't know if you're familiar with that documentary. Oh, yes, yes, I have seen it. Yeah, it's terrific. Any, anyway, we're going to continue if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Uh, uh, you have to know about this. This is, and this is, the Wall Street Journal writers know how to write. The book is The Boom, How Fracking Ignited the American Energy Revolution and Changed the World, which indeed it can if we allow it to. Russell Gold is the uh, author, senior energy reporter, Wall Street Journal. The book is up at DennisPrager.com. We continue in a moment. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Dennis Prager, and a good Monday to you all. You all hear about fracking. It can change the world for the better. And that is what this book is about, The Boom, How Fracking Ignited the American Energy Revolution and Changed the World. Russell Gold is the senior energy reporter for the Wall Street Journal. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Russell. So so, uh, you explained very clearly, uh, it was very helpful to me as well, uh, what fracking is. Mm -hmm. And this ratio, 70% is for oil, 30% is for gas, but that's because oil prices are higher, so it's more profitable. Exactly. Now, uh, the uh, and then I, I began, for those just tuning in, asking about the earthquake issue. Prior to this earthquake issue, what was the objection of the anti-frackers? Well, it really begins talking about water. The, the first thing you hear is a lot of talk about water, then when it became clear that there were just you know we weren't talking about water wells everywhere going bad that these were very limited um, instances and it was fairly easy to to wrap our arms around and fix then you heard a lot about air emissions and now you're hearing about earthquakes so it's there, there's been a sort of a, a moving target being placed on fracking by by many of the the fractivists and and the people who oppose it right well what was what's wrong with the water I don't I don't, I don't follow. Well, there had been some instances in Pennsylvania where water wells, uh, these are rural water wells, had suddenly gotten methane in them, gotten natural gas in them, or had other contaminants. Uh, and there were charges that, well, fracking itself was causing the problem. The answer is no, fracking isn't causing the problem. If you build the well that you're going to be drilling down into poorly, well, yes, you might create a pathway for for some chemicals or some contaminated water, briny water maybe, to, to come up the backside of the well. Um, so there's been a, you know, there, there, there is and continues to be a focus on building wells properly, making sure that wells are, are, have good integrity so that that doesn't happen. Okay. That's what it would seem to me. Now, it would seem to me as well that fracking alone could solve our energy needs. Well, fracking has done a remarkable job on a number of fronts. You know, we talk about oil independence or, or, or energy independence. We're probably never going to be independent, you know, cut off from every other nation in the, in the world. But that's okay. I'm not sure we, we'd want to be. What all this increased energy production has meant is that we're no longer dependent on any one nation. No one nation can, can sort of bully us, you know, bully the United States, or, or influence foreign policy by threatening to cut off the supply of oil or, or gas, because we're making enough of it. So we're importing less and less. And, and that's, that's a positive development, really. And, and there's a certain amount of independence in, in that by itself. If you're no longer dependent on any one country, if you can tell that country, well, you know, we're not going to follow what you're telling us, we can go somewhere else for the oil and gas that we need. You know, that gives you a lot more options in, 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 in what, your politics. What, but what does prevent us from being fully independent? Well, we're not quite. <laughs> oh, what does prevent us? Well, yeah. we're, we, we use absolutely enormous amounts of oil and gas. And uh, the, in terms of oil, I haven't, seen any, I haven't seen any real forecasts that put us at independence um, any time in the near future. We have such a tight relationship with Canada, it's not clear why we'd ever want to be independent from them. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to be dependent on Canada. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah. North America? Yes. You want to talk about North America? Yes. Well, North America, that might be realistic in the next couple, of, you know, next 15, 20 years. Is, is Canada getting so much of its oil from fracking? Not so much, although it's getting a lot of natural gas from fracking. Um, so it's, it has started fracking, and, and there's a whole area out uh, in the western part of Canada 
where they're going back. This is an old oil field, and they're going back in and fracking it and finding out that, that this oil field that they thought was played out um, has natural has gas. Now, now uh, you talked about prices. If we replace Russia for Western Europe as the natural gas supplier, the prices will go up. Yes, if we start exporting a lot of natural right. gas, yeah. no question, prices will go up. Um, and that's why there's a very hard... I was in, I was in uh, Washington, D.C. a couple of days ago, and there's a big debate going on in D.C. as to how we should use all this gas. Should we export more of it? Should we use it to power um, manufacturing, uh, build a lot of new petrochemicals? Uh, you know, what should we do with it? Uh, that's an argument and a discussion I think we're going to see play out a lot over the next 12 months. Um, I can tell you there is there is some good news though. When the United States produces more oil and gas, and, and written articles about this, uh, the volatility has gone away. These sudden twenty dollar price swings in oil oh. have gone mm-hmm. away because mm-hmm. we've, we've essentially we're, we're not so tight anymore in this global oil picture. I mean, a few years ago, two thousand five, two thousand six, we'd have a hurricane come through the Gulf of Mexico and knock out a million barrels a day, and, and we just didn't have the spare capacity globally, and prices would go way up. We're not at that point anymore, and, and that, that's a good thing. How far down is fracking? How far below the surface? Depends where you go, but you're, you're talking two miles easily. It's astonishing. A uh, mile and a half, two miles. Yeah, typically you're, you're two miles. It's really the technology here to be able to, to drill a well straight down and then steer it exactly where you want it to be a couple miles beneath the earth is, is really pretty remarkable and it took quite a while and a number of different technological where uh, are they getting the area. water that's doing the fracking where do they get that water from well if you uh, mostly it's, it's coming from local sources up in North Dakota it's coming from uh, some of the local dam lakes in South Texas where they're doing a lot of it they're they're just pulling it out of the earth and that, that that's a that's an issue because there are lots of important uses wherever you go there are many competing uses for water we yeah, need it for agriculture exactly. We need it for human consumption. Mm-hmm. We need it for uh, industry. These are all very vital and valuable uses. The oil and gas industry can outbid everyone, and that, it's not a fair fight right now. And I think there, there are ultimately going to be some changes made so that there's more of a balance to say, okay, well, we don't want to completely wipe out our agriculture industry. We want and to it's make not sure it re- and that water is not reusable, obviously. You can recycle some of it that comes out, but most of the water used in fracking goes down into Earth and doesn't come back right, out. Right, right, exactly. Some of it comes back out. You can recycle uh, uh, a little of it. This is pr- this is a question that will surely betray my ignorance, mm. but I'll, uh, it's the only way you learn, and so I'll ask it. Sure. Why can What prevents ocean water from being used? That's a, actually that is one of the most important, great questions that I've been asked so far. Nothing. The reason we don't use uh, wa- uh, salty water, and we don't even have to go to the ocean, there's lots of salty water in underground aquifers underneath our feet all across the country. The reason we don't use it is that we started off using regular water, and we developed all of our chemistry, all the right mixtures of chemicals and this and that based on naturally fresh potable water. Now we're moving into brackish water. Uh, and insisting that you use brackish or salty water, I think, is a great common sense response to what's going well, on. Well, you're a common sense man. Folks, the book is The Boom, Russell Gold. I hope to speak to you again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What movie is that from? Why do I think it's movie music? Am I right? It's not? Oh, it is classical. Oh, Lieutenant Kija Sweet by Prokofiev. I knew I knew it. That's right, exactly. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. Something important philosophically slash psychologically slash pedagogically (laughs) just took place on the Dennis Prager show. And it is an... I, I want to play it for you. It just happened. I want to play it for you in order to give you a living example of a statement that, again, one of those many aphorisms I was taught in my Jewish school uh, growing up, and that has, that was so terrific in guiding my life. I, I attribute to this phrase... That comes, I think it, I, yeah, it comes from the Talmud. So it's very, very old. 
this uh, this phrase, I I attribute my ability to learn languages uh, in large measure to, and that is, uh, it works out. Of course, the original is uh, it flows well, but the translation uh, is essentially the easily embarrassed doesn't learn. And uh, I have so adopted that. I did it in languages, so I, I never feared sounding like a dummy uh, when I would go in, uh, to a country and start mumbling things in their language. And so uh, if you're afraid to make mistakes, you'll never be corrected, and then you won't learn much. So that was a tremendous aid in my learning a number of languages now but here uh, is uh, just happened before your ears on this show five minutes ago uh, so I hope we have it do you have my preface okay l- listen to what happened as I was interviewing this Wall Street Journal reporter on his book on fracking this is a question that will surely betray my ignorance mm. but I'll uh, it's the only way you learn and so I'll ask it. Sure. Why can't, what prevents ocean water from being used? That's a, actually, that is one of the most important, great questions that I've been asked so far. Okay, no. okay. <laughs> so, listen to, so listen to that. I, w- I, I totally open in saying, look, I know it's going to betray terribly. I, I thought that asking why can't ocean water be used will will almost elicit, and I knew he wouldn't do it, he's not going to insult me, but almost elicit, elicit internal laughter. But is this guy an idiot? We're going to pump salt water you know, into, into the earth? Instead, he goes, one of the most brilliant questions you, you, you've asked, or you can ask, one can ask, that he's been asked. Okay, there you go. And so I was... I was prepared to sound ignorant and announced it in order to learn. Because if I were embarrassed at sounding ignorant, and remember, this is not embarrassed in front front of a couple of friends at a dinner party. This is embarrassed, you know, with millions of people potentially listening, so... Uh, uh, but I, I don't know any other way of learning. And that aphorism, the easily embarrassed doesn't learn, is what has done it for me. And so I just wanted to use this as a, as a learning opportunity for all of us to give you an idea. That's why I went on, on Fridays when I do the third hour and I say, you know, call in on anything. And, don't, and I often will add... What you think is a silly question may end up to be a particularly good one. I I have never gotten a silly question from someone who thought their question was silly. I have gotten silly questions from people who pompously (laughs) thought that their question was of extraordinary depth and wasn't. So uh, just a learning opportunity here. The easily embarrassed doesn't learn. 1 8 Prager 776. We continue on the Dennis Prager Show. Dennis Prager here, and let's go to uh, Tallinn, Estonia, and Yanis. Yanis, hi, Dennis Prager. Hello, Mr. Prager. Hi. I want to thank for your work, what uh, you are doing. I mean, uh, really seriously, I, were, I have listened to almost uh, one and a half years yeah. every night. I have uh, three times a lot of it. Well, I, I'm, I'm very, very delighted. How, uh, let me see, how old are you? I'm 32 years old. 32 years old. Uh, are, and how did you learn about my show in Estonia? Uh, for my mobile phone, your, actually. Your mother's friend? No, 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 no. 
not my mother's friend. I learning from in internet. I was uh, oh, I'm watching sorry. in your uh, in. Not, I'm sorry, you learned it from the internet. Yeah. I see. And and uh and now do you do you, you listen uh, at night in uh, in Tallinn? Yeah, I was listening. But I am a place uh, where it's really bad uh, uh mobile. Excuse uh, you have to excuse me. I have a little bit of... Oh, I think we may have lost him. Hello. All right. Look, I'll I'll put him on hold there. Th- th- this is uh, this is very important to me. Uh, oh, it just it just totally disconnected. We I know that we have listeners around the world. This is the this is the new world we live in, thanks to internet. My last book, w- still the best hope. Subtitle is. Why the world needs American values to triumph. When when somebody calls me, a relatively young person from Estonia, and say that they listen, uh, it uh, brings uh, it brings optimism to my heart. And so uh, that's the power. I mean, look, as you know, we I mean we get calls regularly from Canada. But uh, we get mail from around the world, and I was. And same with Prager University. Okay, that's good. It's a very, it's a very healthy thing. I've never believed that the values that many of you and I stand for are confined to Americans. It'd be a very odd thing. Americans are no different from anybody else. So either what what I have to say is relevant to everybody or it's not relevant to Americans. It's got to be universally. These values have to be universally applicable. If big government is bad for Americans, then it's bad for Estonians. Right? Just to give one of many examples. If God is necessary for there to be a, a, a an objective good and evil uh, it, it it's not it can't be just applicable to America it's got to be applicable to Estonia too all right Yanis thank you I'm, I'm sorry that uh, the, the somehow we got disconnected but I want to send me an email I'd love to hear from you there's an article in the New York Times which only professors could write. You know, a la the famous, or apropos of the famous line from George Orwell, is an idea that's so stupid only an intellectual could believe it. This is a co-authored article by Abbas Milani. He heads the Iranian Studies Program at Stanford and is co-director of the Iran Democracy Project at the Hoover Institution, which is an institution that I love and I've been affiliated with. So it's a little a little depressing to read this. Israel Weizmel Manor is a senior lecturer at the University of Haifa and a visiting associate professor of political science at Stanford. And the, uh, the title of the article is, Are Iran and Israel Trading Places? And uh, here is, you've got to hear the thesis of the article. Iran is becoming secular and democratic. And Israel is becoming a religious theocracy, which, of course, is redundant. A theocracy is religious, but I just... Or a, the, a, theora, a theocratic non-democracy. How is that? And uh, I I guess you got to believe uh, you have to uh, either have the ability to be a prophet or you have to be a professor to write this. Uh, the optimism with which they regard Iran is quite uh, breathtaking. Even if Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, is still opposed to reforms, it appears that some officials inside Iran have finally realized that continued intransigence and bellicosity will beget only more sanctions and catastrophic economic consequences. 
What does that mean? What does that mean? It's, it's the issue. The, it's it, it skirts the whole issue. The whole issue is: Will Iran give up its pursuit of nuclear weapons because of uh, sanctions and catastrophic ec- and their catastrophic economic consequences? The answer is no. They're not giving up their nuclear weapons. Israel's secular Democrats are growing increasingly worried that Israel's future may bear an uncomfortable resemblance to Iran's recent past. Iran's recent past? You mean Iran has stopped being a theocratic dictatorship? Oh, it gets worse. I'll be back in a moment. I'm Dennis Prager. Hello, everybody. You're listening to The Dennis Prager Show. We've covered a number of issues this hour, but not the news events of the weekend. Because I covered them at length in the first hour, but I just do want to remind you uh, that I will again. And I want to remind you about uh, Prager Utopia, the ability to hear uh, all of my shows when you want, uh, any way you want. It's $5 a month on a subscription and... uh, as I always say, five dollars more than free, huh? Great Passover present. Great Passover present. That's right. Could be done right now. How many people give Passover presents? How do you have to claim it? Uh, okay, I, he's, he's, this is one of the rare moments where the living martyr is flipping out. You, you must understand. He, he, you feel like you want to sell your stocks. I don't think I own any stocks, but he, that's how you feel when he starts flipping out. The the it's an Easter gift. Who who gives Easter gifts? The same people who give Passover gifts. The same same proportion. All right. Okay. Okay. He's flipping out. Okay. Anyway, I just want you to know about that. But I I will address the issue. I I had mentioned a number of things with regard to the killer uh, in uh, uh, in Overland Park, Kansas. And when did I play the gentleman come? Or when did I say it was that last hour or this hour? That was last hour. I, the police chief of Overland Park, Kansas, referred to the murderer as a gentleman. And I'm not attacking the police chief. I, I, uh, he has his own, a lot of more serious problems. But uh, news reporters do that, too, where a murderer is referred to as a gentleman by a news reporter on the scene. And it is an example of as I said earlier, of the ear not hearing what the mouth says. Why would you call a murderer a gentleman? Is is that the word for every person, every man is a gentleman? It's, uh, we, I think it's a fear of making a moral judgment, period. It's when the New York Times announced so many years ago, I would love to, love to find out, that they were, they were going to call even criminals Mr. It used to be that they were referred to in news uh, pieces just by their last name, but not, not Mr. We're afraid to make judgments. Except people do make judgments. The irony is that the same people who do that do make judgments. Usually they're they're the wrong ones. So I uh, will review some of the uh, weekend and got a lot more to talk to you about. You are listening to The Dennis Prager Show.